So, what I want to talk about is um, a mixture of things. Some, some work that I've been doing over the past kind of five years, combined with some much more recent stuff that's kind of currently being transformed um, into a book. I'm a few months late because of the month I'm at Pal Palgrave chasing me, or are going to be chasing me, especially if they see this online. Um, which is all about people's social networking activity as related to kind of everyday life. But particularly what I've been interested in is up till now, I've seen a lot of studies around kind of social networking sites, but they tended to be single site studies. And there's not that much comparative work out there. And what I've had a chance to do over the past few years is look at a range of different sites with different kinds of people engaging with them. And I'm, what, I'm, what I'm working towards is trying to do some kind of meta-analysis of what that all means if we start thinking about the diversity of social networking practice that's out there. And one of the things that's um, coming through for me, which is what I want to kind of talk to you about today, and I really would appreciate feedback on it, is um, assumptions around connectedness and not so much disconnected, but I'm going to talk about disconnectedness. Um, and there's a particular um, kind of idea um, that some of you will be familiar with known as kind of networked publics. And I'll go into that in, in more detail shortly. But I think there's, we've, we've got to be really careful that potentially there could be a bit of an assumption in there that these network publics play out in the way that we talk about them. And I'm not necessarily convinced that that's the case. And that's what I want to really talk about is kind of think about... Um, was uh, critiquing or maybe, not necessarily just critiquing, but maybe understanding network publics in a kind of deeper fashion. And so what I'm going to do is start off by talking a little bit about network publics and some stuff that actually came before that. And then I've got some kind of themes around um, social networking practice, which is rooted in kind of studies that I've done and some field work um, that I've also um, just re more recently been doing interviews with people about their social networking practice to give you kind of some thematic pointers to maybe how we might understand network Work publics in kind of greater greater detail. As it were. And there's themes such as um, play, work, health and well-being, and ethics and law and relationships within all of that. So that is kind of a thematic thing that I will go through. Um, and, yeah, and by all means, do stop me and ask me things as we kind of go along. I'll just click on this, and it should move. Can I use this? Uh, is it going to go? It was going before. Okay, Ben, while you're dealing with that, question, yep. uh, are you going to touch a little bit on riots and networks and the social media today on CNN? Thank is, you. Uh, uh, that one. Uh, social networks are playing a big role in the riots and, and discontent and, and civil discontent. Any that going not in this, no. It's the, it's the one, actually, it's the one that, I suppose you could put that down under play, I suppose. <laughs> I'm joking. But no, actually, no, kind of policy. I mean, that would that will come under some of the areas of ethics and law, although you, you might kind of argue, but I've not got actually data on that um, to talk about with me today. Um, so, just to follow up on what yeah. you said, so I understand that social networks have been used a lot to organize flash mobs. Yeah. And, and, and then the writing that you're talking about um, there's an element of that. There's a little bit, not a small bit, but yes, in relation to health, actually, but it's a very small one. Um, so, um, the idea of network publics, which I'll talk about in a moment, kind of was really kind of pushed around kind of 2007, 2008. But actually, if you rewind, you can actually go back to 1997 and look at Deborah Johnson's work, where she talks about the special characteristics of communication in computer-mediated networks. And, and I kind of bring this up because I think it's really interesting that even at that time, okay, it, it, I mean, depending on where you look, people weren't using the internet as much or in the same way. It was much more of a niche kind of activity, and it still is in, in certain areas. But I think what we can say today without getting too kind of technologically deterministic about it is we have got maybe more people engaging with um, kind of networking practice and, and the internet more generally beyond just maybe shopping for goods than we did in the past. So this was a, a very particular point in time. But she did talk about the idea of like Think issues such as scope, you know, the fact that you know you've got a much potentially potentially a much broader reach. Um, she talked about anonymity, and I think that was potentially a function of the way people were using the internet in kind of personal ways through kind of forums where maybe you might not have been named. Although there was very much kind of stuff going on where you were using your name at that time as well. Um, she also talked about reproducibility, the idea that once information goes online, it can be kind of cut and paste 
elsewhere, and that that also might link in with ideas of kind of um, the possibility of permanence as well. So if we just take those for the moment, I think it's interesting, but then if we look at um, more recent stuff. You then got Mimi Ito's work where she she talks about like she introduces the idea of network publics when and it's not very specific about the actual characteristics of them um, and leaves it quite open, which I quite like actually. But just talking about this idea about you know kind of how people respond and remakes of, of media. And then Dana Boyd comes in here talking about kind of networks publics as displaying these characteristics of persistence, um, replicability, um, and invisible audiences. You know the idea that they Basically, once it's on there, it's persistent. The data's there. It's searchable. In that, you know, people, people can use Google or other kind of search search techniques to find information about you. It's replicable in the sense it's kind of reproducible, as Deborah, talk, Deborah Johnson had talked about it. And this idea of invisible audiences, where you're not quite sure who's looking at what you've done and where, because of all these other things as well. So, it's, in some ways, it's kind of interesting to look at kind of Dana's work and Deborah Johnson's work of 1997 and see how there's very much similarities within that. But I think the thing that um, for me that I think we have to be kind of careful about is just not reading these as technologically deterministic. Just because it's it, you're putting data out there, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it will be searchable, actually. It's not always the case. It's not always going to be replicable, and this is what I'm going to kind of talk to you about and show you, actually, in certain ways. Um, so I'm not sure that necessarily, although we have this discourse around kind of network publics, I to just be a little bit careful that we don't kind of read it in a kind of technologically deterministic fashion. People will play with this idea and will, um, or not as the case may be, and it's not just people. The other thing that I want to talk about is the role of what you might see as kind of the non-human. So I will talk about kind of devices and infrastructures and interfaces and how they may also play a part in all of this. And I suppose underlying all of this is uh, maybe a basic understanding of power as well, because I think what we're talking about within a lot of this is kind of power relations. Um, and for me, I kind of really like Stephen Luke's work on power, where he kind of talks about kind of power being exercised within structurally determined limits, which is basically the whole agency versus structure kind of argument. You know, if we have, do we have complete agency to do what we want, or are we structured into doing things? And the, you know, the, the answer is we have a bit of both. Really, it's always a dance between between the two. Um, and he talks about these kind of, you know, whether you've got external or internal constraints, whether it's positive or negative, or whether you've got ends and means, but more particularly, and I think these all colour in what I'm kind of talking about behind the scenes. I want to talk about this. But then he, he talks about these three different kinds of power, and you've got like the, kind of the one which is the most basic form of power. It's basically, I get you to do what I want you to do. Um, the second form is, but I was like, I describe this as like what I tell my students, basically, is like, you can hand your work in on this day or this day. So I give you a little bit of a agency, but I kind of ultimately control the end point. And then the final one is basically where I get you to do something um, that's not in your interest and you don't even realise that you're doing it. So a kind of classic example of that is in the UK context, is working class people voting for Margaret Thatcher. It just wasn't in their interest to do it, but they did it anyway, and it was just so persuasive that it happened. And I think that a lot of this is intertwined with the idea of network publics and how it plays out. And I think what we're doing is, to some extent is using the idea of network publics, but not really interrogating it as much as we should be, and that's what I kind of want to colour in a little bit today. So, I'm just going to ignore that one. But so, in order to do that, what I want to do to kind of try to help us kind of nuance network publics and what's happening with them is look at these kind of areas. So, the mediating access is looking at kind of devices and infrastructures, that kind of thing. Look at some of the stuff on relationships, play, leisure, homework, health and well-being, ethics and law. And I've kind of got loads of kind of case study examples and stuff from work I've been doing to talk through that now. Now, so we've got that kind of theory background to, to this stuff. So, if we start with mediating access. Um, and some of this will seem pretty obvious, but what I'm not seeing a lot of the time is a lot of this being talked about and considered in, in studies um, around kind of social networking sites. Um, so point one, there are different kinds of social networking sites, and, and thus the idea of network publics playing out in them is going to kind of operate kind of slightly differently. On top of that, we're accessing sites via different kind of devices and networks and infrastructures. So what I've been talking to people about in their interviews is what devices do they use to access stuff? Where do they access things? What kind of networks do they use? Are they using a Wi-Fi network? Are they using a 3G network? Is it a LAN-based? Are they using a laptop? Are they using a mobile phone? 
And also, if you think about one, any one specific site, so this is Twitter, you can access Twitter, for example, via different things. You can access it via an app, you can access it via your desktop, um, you can access different apps via different phones. So that this all, I would argue, kind of mediates the user experience in this particular area and, and, and interferes and supports the way that maybe networks operate. If you're thinking about kind of repurposing content, that can be muddied by the fact that you're working off a 3G network versus a Wi-Fi network network versus a LAN, that kind of thing. Um, and I think what's also interesting in relation to interfaces as well is how interfaces change over time. And so what you've got here is from some work that I did um, in face with Facebook looking at um, the, the um, privacy receding into the background. So what you've got, if you look in, in July 2008, um, what you'll see is that privacy was in the top left, right hand corner of, of the interface as a distinct badge. In August 2008, it dropped into a drop down menu, so you had to click on something to actually get to the privacy settings. It even had a little padlock, padlock on there, like kind of a symbolic note that this is kind of privacy. And then by February 2010, it had dropped back even further. And it's kind of gone back further again. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. And then the narrative that runs alongside this, if you look at the bottom there, you'll see that you've got a quote from um, Mark Zuckerberg, basically saying people have gotten really comfortable not only sharing more information in different kinds, but more with more people. That social knowledge is just something that has evolved over time. I'm not actually quite sure about that. I think, you know, the interfaces are having a big part to play in that. And you've only got to look at when interfaces change on Facebook, the furore that you get over a particular point. I don't know what's happening, da, 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 and people trying to lock things down or not on not, not, not being able to navigate them so well. And um, let's skip to it. And so what I did was I asked some people, and this is just to add a bit of further colour into this idea of devices actually doing stuff um, and engaging with people. So it's not just my assessment of this, although I've kind of worked in Facebook for some time now through ethnography. But um, actually talking, we'll ask people. So I've asked people. So it's, and it's interesting how different things work for different people. So for example, you've got people here talking about how they they want to upload photos in a particular way. So the, 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 the actual uploading and sharing things happen via different things because it offers them different different technologies, often different affordances. Similarly, on the second point, you've got somebody, um, oh, I can't, I've not got a very good signal, so I won't do it at work. I'll wait till I'll get home. So these, these things are impacting on how people engage with network publics and social networking sites. And then also, if they're actually doing other things that go beyond social network sites as well, so if somebody's downloading content on the laptop, it, it slows up one area, so then they go to their phone and start accessing the phone to do things as well. So you've got these kind of set networks of arrangements that are actually impacting on how network publics play out. And I think what we've been doing is talking about network publics in a very kind of generic and blanket, where we say, oh yeah, we have network publics and they work like this. And actually what I'm trying to say is, well, actually they do and they don't, and there are things that come in the way, and I think devices um, and interfaces are one thing that do that. And then if we look in the, if we move on to the next theme and look in the area of kind of relationships, I think the thing that strikes me is when we, we talk about relationships, what we're ultimately, what we're basically talking about, I think, and I think then this needs my kind of more unpacking, is we're talking about people navigating these kinds of areas. So you have, and this, this is a bit clunky and I think it still needs a bit more work, but if you think about it, we kind have our public life um, within kind of public life there's really 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 public stuff that we kind of want to share but then there are other like and then there are other aspects of our public life that are kind of a bit more private so we might have kind of discussions uh, at work in a closed meeting or online in a meeting and it's kind of public stuff but it's kept kind of private rather than the public stuff I might just do a public up status update on for or, or Twitter for work purposes. So there's kind of this public in public and private in public. And similarly, what you end up with is, you know, public private. Um, I, I'll do a state face, Facebook update to everybody, private stuff, but it's public and that. And then private, almost like personal private, pri private stuff where I'm kind of maybe not wanting members of my family to see stuff. And I think what we're seeing with the, with the relationships kind of is people trying to navigate those kinds of, of areas. And again, so the whole thing about kind of whether or not things get repurposed or not gets, um, from a network public's perspective, gets muddied by some of this stuff. But I think what's interesting as well 
is the nature of relationships that we've been talking about in, in this kind of area. Because what I've seen is people talk about, for example, um, dating sites as not social networking sites. Um, people kind of conceptualize them very much as, oh, it's Facebook or it's Twitter. But what I've been seeing when I talk to actual um, my research participants, and it's what I've thought for some time, is that actually they've got a much broader take on what a social networking site is, and they often list loads of, and actually talk about internet dating sites as social networking sites, because they just think about, it's just networking, and it's social, and that's what I do. So whether or not, as academics, we talk, we characterise them in one way, what my experience is, is that people are talking about them in a much, much broader sense. And I think that opens up anyway, just a whole... Um, Another thing that's interesting as well is that what I'm finding is participants telling me, well, the, the web's so shifting and what we're shifting so much and what we're seeing is social networking functionality kind of stuff being embedded in many other places as well. So it's, it's not just in Facebook. You can find it on newspaper websites where you can have a profile on travel sites where you have a profile and you're actually doing different kinds of social networking within those spaces as well. It's a very much a moving kind of target. Um, so whilst you will get, and these, again, these are a couple of quotes from um, some of the interviews. These are kind of kind of well-worn ones. Well, the first one is particularly that whole idea that we've maybe read about in the press where people have maybe lost their job or potentially lost their job because they've said something, done something that they shouldn't have or were perceived, perceived not to um, um, that was perceived as um, problematic in relation to work. But then what I've also seen as well is people talking about very kind of different kind of things. So there was one interview who was talking about the fact that they wouldn't start talking about the fact that they looked at um, um, history websites because they had these very strange alternate histories. And um, what it was about, it, it was things like um, conspiracy theories and stuff. And they just wouldn't share it with people because they didn't want people to think about them in a odd, you know, kind of way. And so there was the, these kind of the, this was kind of muddy in their relationship. And I think it's really unpacking some of those those relationships a bit more on, on what they actually mean rather than just think of it as a basic friending or it's due to my family. Um, because what I've also seen that there's some stuff on apprenticeship relationships, which I'll talk to you a little bit later about in, in relation to YouTube and creativity and graffiti. But um, also, there's another example here, uh, just to give you a different kind of take on relationships from some work I've been doing, around kind of celebrity and relationships with celebrity. And what I've seen in this in this work is this is basically a story of um, a guy in Manchester who's pictured there, who was um, around in around the year 2000, 2001, um, and went through to 2003. So this predated um, social networking sites, at least in the you know particularly in the UK um, as we as we know them. And um, there's basically a fan site on Facebook for him. And he was known literally just in Manchester for walking up and down one particular street. And the story goes, we don't know, but the story goes was that he heard that somebody was spotted as a model um, on that street. And so he spent his life walking up and down the street in the hope of the same fate. So his idea was that I'll be spotted by a talent scout and I'll become a model as well. And he was seen as something kind of as, as, an, as an oddity, really. And then, um, and every time I talk to people about this, they say, oh, yeah, we've got somebody in our town that's a bit like that. And you know these kind of eccentric, so-called odd people who are known for doing things. And what's happened is he's become kind of a form of celebrity within this. So the relationship that has developed is almost like one that you would have. It's called like almost like non-reciprocal intimacy at a distance. It's known in celebrity studies. The idea that you feel that you've kind of got a relationship with this person, but it's maybe not as, not as reciprocal. As far as I can tell, this guy does not know that this exists. He's never commented on the site. Nobody quite knows where he's gone. They think he was a Greek exchange student. Um, and this is, this is still operational today, 10 years after um, he left Manchester in 2003. And, and so what you've got is network publics being used to kind of engage in kind of celebrity relationships as well. And, and what you see after there's some studies like Dana Boyd's some, done some work and Alice Marwick had done some work in relation to celebrity. But I think that our relationships with celebrities is an area where I think we could do some more work looking at kind of, and particularly again looking at network public ideas in there when we're dealing with maybe public figures. Um, 
um, because I think there's also some interesting stuff that can come in um, from celebrity studies. So there's work by Kerry or Ferris on kind of the she's called the moral order of the street, basically, and it's basically about how we navigate public spaces and the moral order of the street. Normally, we just walk about, don't really, you know, acknowledge each other. But what you might find that that gets skewed when you maybe engage with celebrities. So there's that idea where maybe you follow them around, want to know where they go, and this is what happened with this guy. There's narratives of people saying, "Oh yeah, we followed him around to see exactly where he went. We took photographs of him," and this was just, you know. Joe Bloggs walking down the street and, and then was, uh, you know, attributed this kind of celebrity stuff um, kind of to them. And what I've seen is this recognition and response work where you kind of recognise something and go, oh, is that Bruce Willis or is it not? And then it's like, well, what do you do after that? Do you actually go up and get a signature from them? Do you follow them around? Or do you just pretend that you don't recognise them um, as a celebrity? Um, and what you can see is um, this idea of recognition and response work working in other areas. So basically I've, I've got stories from the interviews of people seeing somebody that they thought they knew from somewhere and then actually using Google to find out more. So the response was they reckon, oh, and, and these are just individual people. This response work then kicks in and they Google them and find up, find various identities they've got and then make an assumption about them about whether they're going to engage with them further. So I think there's some really interesting ways that we can kind of nuance some of the network public stuff by engaging with kind of celebrity studies as well. So if you move on to kind of the other next thing, play and leisure, and this ties into um, some of the stuff on apprenticeship as well. Right, I'll get that. Um, is a picture a screen grab from uh, the New York subway system. 149th Street is known um, and was known for quite some while as, a, as an intersection of graffiti artists because you've got lots of trains coming through and it was a way for people place for me. And, and the point about this is it, it, we've always had mediators of networking activity. It just happens that this one's a train station. Um, and I did some work um, with Marie Griffiths looking at young people and graffiti practices and what this shows you is a different kind of relationship that feeds into kind of play and leisure. It's, it's a form of apprenticeship that happened via YouTube. So what you've got is young people engaging in creative practice, learning from each other about how to do graffiti, the ethics of doing graffiti. The guy here was doing it on his garden wall. His mum actually gave him the garden wall to do graffiti on so he wasn't going off and doing it in places that um, he shouldn't be. Um, but what also happened within this study was that people were actually engaging with established graffiti artists as well to, through that learning process. So it gives you kind of a different kind of take on how people are engaging with network publics in this sense and the relationships that they might have, which is much more of kind of an apprenticeship one, even amongst um, young people themselves. So it wasn't... Um, common to see comments such as this where you get a very very supportive comment about oh that looks really good and then people and there was other ones where people were asking for advice about how you do things so a different kind of relationship that's apprenticeship interwoven with with notions of kind of friendship but what also was interesting was how the one of the particular people we interviewed in this study wanted to keep him, himself very separate in this activity from the rest of his friends as well so they don't do that this is what i do on my own and so even then he found ways of kind of navigating that which I think was um, going through I'm going to skip through this one but then go on to this one because I think this, this is interesting as well that this is kind of taking play and leisure into much more of an institutional context I've done a bit of work working with the Imperial War Museum and with colleagues and also with the London Symphony Orchestra as well and with the London Symphony Orchestra basically what they wanted to do was engage a Web2 enabled social network enabled app to get more people to go to classical music um, concerts um, is a short, short story I'm going to show you just a couple of the quotes from this. So basically, this is one basic where we were asking them about, okay, so you can buy tickets through this app. How would you feel about having a program that kind of led you through the, the thing? And we got, we got one person out of 82 people that we um, talked with in focus groups saying, yeah, I would like that. Um, we thought it would be a good way of getting more people through the door because it's such a difficult thing to kind of engage with and to understand. Um, but interestingly, the... Um, the uh, the narratives that came back was actually you're supposed to know about this you're not supposed to mess with your phone in this never mind the fact that you would be able to have a paper program you couldn't have this digital program with you as soon as it no 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 you don't do this but what was particularly interested interesting was that basically the audience said 
No, and these were all young people. These were 18 to 21 year olds. So I'm not talking about people who've been doing this for years. These were all young people. And they basically said, they were saying, no. If you, if you haven't grown up with this, you're just not going to be able to get this. You're not going to know about this. And so the, the whole idea of the LSO wanting to engage network publics, which is effectively what they wanted to do, they wanted to engage network publics to try and increase their audience, just wasn't going to work. So it's, so it's the, the cause of very much a set of cultural conditions around classical music where you're supposed to learn it from a very young age. People reported that they learned it through their parents by dragging, parents dragged me to concerts all the time and there's no way I could educate anybody about it because it's just too complicated. So you see that these kind of network publics kind of failing in this kind of institutional content. It's quite interesting because in a UK context very much the Participate Return and Web2 has been pitched to kind of the cultural and creative industries as a way of kind of of adding value for money, evaluating audiences, engaging audience much further. And here we've got a case where potentially it worked, the app worked, but only for the existing audience. And then we were able to extend their audience, but only for the same demographic, not to try and get new people coming through the door. There was a limitation there. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about home and work because it's it's the obvious stuff about, well, you know, around kind of, oh, I don't want somebody seeing that I've been drunk the night before, that kind of thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one for now because I, I want to be able to, for us to talk at the end. But I do want to briefly talk about health and, and well-being. And one of the things that's coming through from the work that I've been doing is around and the potentials for network publics in the health, health context is um, people don't don't want to talk about health issues necessarily in things like status updates, although I've got a few people that do that. The thing that they're coming back and saying is actually, I'll Google stuff for health, which I think we know about. People will seek out in health information on the internet. We know about that. If I've got a very specific condition and there are um, forums and, and kind of closed forums that I can use through, say, Facebook or social network site to, to like, haemophilia is one, then I'm happy to engage with those kind of things. What I'm also happy to engage with is almost like, almost like the politics around health and promoting a health kind of issue, um, as it were. And so I think this is from some work that... Um, I've been doing with a colleague over in the School of, of Nursing and Midwifery around kind of cervical screening for women. It's a campaign that we're running at the moment which engages internet meme culture um, to try and engage women in um, raising their awareness and confidence and actual trying to affect behaviour change around cervical screening because there's kind of low uptake in certain areas. Um, and so it's kind of engaging this idea that there's a preponderance of cats on the internet Loads of people kind of, you know, and we're trying to go a very different route rather than just going down a direct kind of route, as it were. I'm going to skip through that. I don't know if it'll let me skip through this. It's going to take a minute to do it. But this is just a really kind of popular video that gets millions and millions of views. And what we're working on doing, and we have released some of these already, we've got cats dancing on treadmills at the moment out, um, is using things that are completely not health-related to... Um, it's better with the sound effects, it kind of bongs, but... Um, to basically try and engage people in this, in this kind of process. And so what we've... Um, produced is things like this piece of software um, and what it will do is it will show you basically what it does um, is you basically can get a picture of a cat um, upload it and then you can dress it um, and what it does it comes up with health messages in and amongst the kind of cut and paste me mentality of kind of a health context kind of thing um, and then what you can do is share that via various networks and the key part of this is a lot of the stuff that's talked about in relation to health and digital media is that um, it's, it's talked about as an interactive media as we can engage the participate return but what you often see is it's very much a didactic process so we see in the, the NHS they might have a Facebook page in various areas but it's locked down nobody can comment nobody can do anything it's very much right we'll give you the health information and that's it and what we're trying to do here is engage women in the production of health materials as well so really engage with the idea of the participate return um, within this kind of um, setting. So use net network publics in a very real sense, the idea of kind of, yeah, so it is searchable, it is reproducible, we want people to do this kind of stuff um, in this kind of way. I think this will flick over in a moment. And then the last one um, that I will go through I think it will let me click off that now is um, 
no, it just it will just run through this in a moment. The, the, the reason I put this on here is just as a, as a problem of engagement. So what is, this is very quickly showing you is um, this is a Twitter feed, and this is after there was a television program um, of Her Horizon, um, a kind of well-known BBC program on in the UK. It was all about cats and what cats did. They strapped cats to cameras. They did GPS on cats and really tried to understand the life of the secret life of the cat. And what what I did was I went on Twitter after to try and engage with this to try and help promote the campaign and it's going a bit slow but what it shows you is how difficult it was because literally the program was so popular it was just this stream of content and you just could not it, you just, it, trying to engage it was just almost impossible um, to kind of do this kind of stuff so it's although there's kind of some kind of benefit to this there are some difficulties as well let's see if it will let me click through this um, whilst this is going through I just want to talk about ethics and law. I mean, the, the, the ethics and law thing which comes after this, I don't know how long this goes on for, I don't want time to run on, um, is, I mean, the kind of the broad point really around the ethics and law stuff is that you get, you're just getting so many mixed, I'm getting so many mixed messages from the participants, not only in the previous work that I've done, but also the interviews that are being conducted at the moment. People have just got some, as we would all kind of guess, people have just got a whole range of kind of moral standards and, and things that they wish to engage with. So how we interrogate or come to decide upon what the ethics of network publics might be is, is just so tricky because of people... Um, thinking about things in, in different kinds of ways. But I mean, one thing that does come up time and time again, which is, is, is really interesting, beyond the work thing, because um, if you look at the literature around kind of work and social networking, a lot of it that comes back is how do we regulate employees, how do we make sure they don't do anything illegal, that, that kind of stuff. Um, the biggest thing is around children that comes up, perhaps unsurprisingly, but what I've seen in interviews is a real interesting kind of um, split between a few people. So you've got somebody here talking about, I've got issues with these people who put pictures of their kids on, on things like Facebook as a particular kind of moral position, and they don't think it's right that parents are doing that. Whether you agree with that or not is a, is a different matter. But at the same time, you then have people who, in the second court, having problems because they've posted something online and then they've been told off by somebody because they've been told that actually I look at Facebook with my children sat beside me. So there's this really weird kind of thing going off where you've got like people complaining about kids being on Facebook on the screen but also watching the screen as well. But then at the same time, I've done work which um, in Habbo Hotel, which um, I'm just going to put this up before I finish to do the conclusion. It's been a bit slow. You know, it might skip through that now. Um, where what I'm seeing is that Habbo Hotel basically incorporates social networking functionality and digital gaming functionality. And part of the networking functionality is that you buy little bits of virtual furniture and you can make your own room with them. What's happening in that space is that you have scammers and these are young kids scamming each other and they scam each other out of the ferny. And what, what, what we've seen in, in this study is that basically they see the scamming as their own game. They're making their own game within the space. Even though it's got networking activity associated, which you might kind of characterize as so-called real life in quotes, um, they're basically saying that it's not real life, it's all virtual stuff, I'm just going to, I'm not robbing off old ladies as I think one of them puts here, it's fine, and they're the mugs for actually paying money for this kind of stuff. And so what you've got is their ethics being muddied by this media convergence as well, when, when these different things are coming together. So you've got a very different take from young people there in terms of ethics of this stuff compared to what adults are saying about them as well and the network and from a network public perspective. So this whole area of how we kind of engage with ethics and law around network publics is just something I think we need so much more kind of kind of work on. So to um, finish up then look, this is my last slide. I think out of all of that and the stuff that I'm seeing is I think you can kind of just see how complicated there is what I, yeah, there is what I've tried to is point to some areas where maybe things haven't been tackled so much. And I do think we maybe need to unpack relationships a bit more. I think there's a lot more work we, that needs to be done um, around ethics. There aren't that many studies of social networking and ethics out there. Um, uh, but 
I think key for me is taking the non-human seriously. Like I was talking about right at the beginning around kind of the devices, networks that gives, and how that's mediating um, network publics. And for me, a starting position, because I come from a kind of science and technology studies perspective, is seeing kind of um, social network sites as these configurable technologies. We roll them out, but then they're subject to infusion, i.e. innovation at the local level. People will play with them and make them work in ways that they want them to. Um, and it's, it is interesting for, because for all of the discourse around oh, privacy is dead, what I'm seeing in the interviews that is giving me kind of pause for thought around some of this is just how um, people do seem to be engaging with privacy and being able to deal with it. And they say, look, that is just completely locked down. And you ask them about their privacy settings, da, 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 da. they actually because they're self-censoring, so they're not bothering about the privacy settings. They're basically saying, I just won't even write about that. And so this, so people are still keeping a lot of stuff behind the scenes. So for all the talk and almost like technological determinism that you might kind of get hooked on to the idea of network publics, I'm not saying that Dana Boyd would come along and be a technologically determinist about this, but some people who hook on to it and say, oh, it's, it's all this privacy is dead, it's all persistent, it's all searchable. Actually, there's still a lot of ongoing work behind the scenes with this stuff that means that actually people are retaining a good degree um, of privacy in particular ways. There's still kind of problems within that, and I think as you've seen in, in some of the comments that have been made. Um, so I think what we need to do is kind of continue, continue to disclose the nature of network publics and maybe uh, theorise them um, you know, in, a, in a much richer fashion. What I see is people just using the term network publics in papers and not really interrogating it and really thinking about the diversity of what's going off with these spaces. And so I think what we need to start asking about is like, look, what importance, if any, do people place on the different features of network publics? So, how important do they see invisible audiences? How important is searchability? How important is persistence? And, and why is that? And how does that change across platforms? And how do devices and, and non-human things interact with that? And, so, and, and finally, the final point is actually, how do network publics, as a non-human idea thing, how do they interact or not with us? How do we engage with them or not? And at that point, I will I'll finish. Thanks very much.